feeling okay. Welcome to the stream. I have to show you this video. Take a look at this dam. This is the Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. It's great because when it is finished, it will be the largest hydroelectric project in Africa. But this billions of dollars project has sparked a bitter dispute between some of the Nile Basin countries. In this episode of The Stream, we will look at what is being known as the GERD, the GERD, what that means for people living in the Nile Basin and whether politicians in Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan can come to an agreement. Hello guests, it's really good to see you. I will say hello to the guests. The guests will introduce themselves to you. Radelowit, nice to have you on the stream. Tell everybody who you are. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Magdalawit. I'm a water sciences researcher based in Addis. Thanks for joining us. Asho, what do people need to know about you for the purposes of our conversation today? Thank you for having me. My name is Asho Swain. I'm a professor of peace and conflict research and uh, uh, UNESCO Chair on International Water Cooperation at Uppsala University, Sweden. I have been working on Nile issue since uh, mid-90s. Nice to have you. Hello, Timothy. Tell everybody who you are. Um, my name is Timothy Caldas. I'm a uh, fellow at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. I work on Egypt's foreign policy and political economy, mm -hmm. both of which are intertwined deeply with uh, these questions around the GERD and its impact. Sure. Migdala, when I say the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, Renaissance, uh, as the name implies. It's uh, it's really a project that's really close and deep to the hearts of people in Ethiopia. Um, it's essentially the people saying we're claiming our destiny again. We're saying no to poverty. We're saying no to uh, injustice. We're saying no to undignified life. And um, yeah, everything flows from there essentially of uh, people funding the project from their own like billions of dollars. I mean, we're not a rich country. So it says a lot that people are willing to fund this, uh, this project on their own. So uh, essentially it is the renaissance of Ethiopia. It's us essentially saying no to poverty, no to undignified life and saying yes to a better future. That is one view from Ethiopia. Timothy, if you could tap into a public view in, in Egypt, how might that be different when they hear about the GERD, when we talk about the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam? What's that perspective like from Egypt? There's a lot of worry. Um, there's a lot of worry about what the dam will do to the flow of the Nile, which is the source of virtually all the water that is used in Egypt. Uh, it's vital for agriculture. It's vital for people's ability to drink and have access to potable water. It's vital for, for industry. Um, and Egypt doesn't really have an alternative that's viable that could replace that. Um, so there's a lot of stress about that. There's a lot of concern about the inability thus far to achieve any sort of binding agreement on the conduct of how, that, how the dam will be used and how water will be regulated. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, concern. Let me just bring in the president of Egypt and the prime minister of Ethiopia to see how they are framing this hydroelectric water project. So we listen. We have spent the better part of a decade in tiresome negotiations with our brothers in the Sudan and Ethiopia through which our aim was to reach an agreement on the filling and operation of the dam. Indeed, the Nile River must not be monopolised by one state. For Egypt, the Nile water is an existential matter. I want to make it abundantly clear that we have no intention to harm these countries. What we are essentially doing is to meet our electricity demands from one of the cleanest source of energy. We cannot afford to continue keeping more than 65 million of our people in the dark. Asho, if you could boil down what the essential debate is here, why would the president of, uh, excuse me, president of Egypt, the prime minister of Ethiopia, be talking about a dam project in the way that they are? I think this is uh, not an ordinary dam. Uh, I think this is a massive uh, dam, the largest development project in Africa. This will make uh, Ethiopia a legitimate uh, uh, user of Nile water. This will break the long tradition of the 
domination of uh, Egypt uh, on the Nile. Uh, Nile has been between shared before between Egypt and Sudan. So for the first time, there will be a change. Uh, but I think this is where uh, the the critical point lies that how mm. it will be on the basis of cooperation. And I think this is what is uh, reflected on the way things are that now both Egypt, uh, particularly Egypt, has realized that the dam has come up. So it's a, it's a somehow it wants a negotiated settlement. And Ethiopia particularly has a spending $5 billion and this massive project, which is much more important for its development, it also wants to uh, um, deal with this or uh, uh, cooperate it in a cooperative manner. We wanted on this show really to focus on people the impact on people. Politicians are having a, a conversation as well, dispute, uh, but on people. I, I want you to listen to some of the Ethiopians who've been working on the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. This is what they have to say about the project. Since this resource is a common, common resource, we have to reasonably and equitably utilize it. So uh, there is no reason that uh, the, the downstream countries should complain on it because we have, this is our resources also. Our country has a huge problem with electricity. It will help us break free from the bondage of poverty and reach every household. Do you see that? Do you see what, uh, how transformative a hydroelectric project in Ethiopia could be? I have no doubt that the Ethiopian people sincerely believe that this is a vital project for them and their development. It's quite clear. Uh, Ethiopians on social media have made that very clear to me in the past. Um, and, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, the majority of Ethiopians have been living without electricity. Uh, it's uh, in 2020. That's unacceptable. And, uh, and I totally understand why they would want uh, to support a project that could change that. They're also, as, as was noted by our other guests, personally invested in this, uh, literally. Uh, many Ethiopians have bought bonds and helped finance the construction of this dam. So they have a, a personal stake as well in it, in that respect. Um, that's not my, I mean, from my view, that's not really what's in dispute. The dispute is around the management of the dam. It's about how will there be an agreement about ensuring that the flow of the water will not harm downstream countries uh, or not significantly harm them. Uh, and to ensure that in periods of drought that there isn't a significant reduction in the flow, which could have adverse impacts on the agricultural and, uh, and uh, fishing uh, environment in both Sudan and Egypt. McDelloway, I, I was really surprised to see this. I, I'm interested in, in, on your take on this. This is the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities sharing on social basically an ad saying this is the source of the Nile we are really important the Nile is important for Egypt and they are seriously appealing to uh, the international public to actually be on their side if there can be a side when you're talking about a dam what do you make of that um I'm not surprised in a way uh, there's this constant narrative of equating the Nile to the existential life of Egypt. And my, the, Timothy also mentioned earlier that the Nile is at the only resource of, the, of Egypt, which is not factually true. There is massive amount of groundwater resources in Egypt, non-renewable groundwater, but renewable. still a massive amount of ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, what I, that's my point. Non-renewable, but nonetheless, a massive amount of groundwater, 55 trillion, billion, trillion cubic meters of water. There's the desalination potential. So let's not frame it as if Nile is the only lifeline of Egypt. It is indeed uh, a major source of the renewable surface water of Egypt. And Egypt has been developed based off of the Nile, this huge civilization, world-known, world-renowned civilization was based of a, uh, built on the Nile. So nobody denies uh, the right of Egypt to live uh, in the sense that is put by the, the ad earlier. Yeah, everybody has the, li uh, has the right to life. And right to life is tied to water, especially in a region like the Nile Basin, uh, which crosses 11 countries. But I agree with President El-Sisi earlier, the Nile should not be monopolized by any one country. And history shows us that the Nile has been monopolized by one country. So the dam is not the problem here. 
it's the status quo in the region, the unjust status quo in the region. That's the root of all the problems in the region. So if we really want to move forward, the dam is not what we have to talk about. The dam is a very minute issue compared to the grand scheme, the grand issue that we have to talk about. Mm. So if we really want to move forward... McDellowitz, uh, Tim Timothy is frowning. Timothy, what's behind that frown? Go ahead. I, I mean, I, look... I, 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 I totally acknowledge that Egypt's behavior with respect to the Nile waters historically has sought to monopolize control over it. And I totally understand why Nile based countries object to that. But to suggest that uh, these alternative sources of water could make up for uh, cuts in flow it ref is, it poorly reflects on you because you understand as a water researcher that the, that the rate of flow is not going to be supplemented by desalin desalination. Nor Why? Why not? Why not? And Why not? The, First of all, the reduction the of flow, the reduction of flow affects fisheries, affects agriculture, affects desertification of land. Egypt has legitimate concerns. I'm not saying that Ethiopia doesn't. They do. But let's talk seriously yeah. about the fact that both of these countries have serious concerns as opposed to pretending like one doesn't. I'm not pretending, and this yeah, this is really a serious issue to me. But if we if we're talking seriously, and which is why I keep mentioning that that the issue is not the grid. What I, what exactly are you talking about when you talk about reduction in the flow? The flow which Egypt is used to historically, the 55.5 billion cubic meters that Egypt yeah. allocated for itself in the 1959 agreement. That's a non-starter for Ethiopia and also all the other riparian countries. This is why I say the GERD is not, the dam is not the fundamental problem. The, I appreciate like, your this honesty huge here because your government is. has been saying that the flow will not be affected, which is objectively untrue. Well, this is a, mm -hmm. this is a hydropower that. project. I appreciate that, No, no, that, no, actually. no, no, so no, do guess. not twist my words. So guess. Just, just, just take a pause for a moment. You said yes, the 55 may, is not let a, me, a let, non let, me, let, let me just take a pause for a moment, because remember, guess, this conversation should start with the people and th we acknowledge that the politicians are arguing about this percentage and that percentage. But let's start with the people, because they're the people who are actually going to be impacted. Let me bring in some Egyptian farmers. And, and McDellaret, I really am interested in what you have to say to them. So let's bring in those Egyptian farmers uh, and hear their perspective. Things have changed. There are higher temperatures than normal during this time. And in winter, it gets colder than before. There is more change in the climate than before. The temperature now is higher than ever, and it has affected our farming. There is very little Nile water. In winter, sometimes there's a bit more, but mainly because the land doesn't need a lot of water in the winter. But in the summer, we don't get any. The dam has already started to fill. As the dam fills, there will be less water available for Egyptian arable land. That means that people will have less water in an area that is uh, historically desert. What do you have to say to them if they lose their arable lands, they lose their livelihoods? How do you resolve that? First of all, the GERD is a hydropower project, which means it's non-consumptive. It will not consumptively use the water. But you're right in framing it that while the dam is filling up, the water will slightly reduce. And the, 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 the narrative that the farmers were giving now resembles more issues with climate change than the actual filling of the dam because this year the amount of water that was held in the dam is 4.9 billion cubic meters. That is just 10% of the annual blue Nile flow, not even the Nile flow, but blue Nile flow. So I think it's quite, uh, the farmers may have that impression and I don't blame them at all, but it's disingenuous to link any kind of uh, climatic or agricultural impacts that the Egyptian farmers may be facing with the GERD. With that said, however, Yes, there are people living on the ground in both Sudan and Egypt actually mm. dependent on the water, as there are people in Ethiopia. That is why the, the, the that is why cooperation is not uh, is not an option in the Nile Basin per se. But that but but just because I mean, life is life, right? A life of an Egyptian farmer is equally important as to a life of Ethiopian farmer. So I only have love and empathy to everybody living along along the Nile Basin because I, I have personally seen how much people are dependent on this water, personally. That is why I, I, I advocate for an equitable and reasonable use going forward, especially when you take climate change and sustainability issues into mind. The water will not be enough for us if we keep at this narrow, um, myopic way of utilizing and 
national uh, capitalizing on nationalistic uh, nationalistic mm -hmm. sentiments and national interest cooperation is yes the way but we have okay. to address the basic basic problem which is the unfair water allocation in the Nile basin right. and there right. are right. Many, right. numerous I, I ways to use the I, water I, sustainably Della, I, I, I hear you. Uh, I also see Asho wringing his hands <laughs> as this debate is going back and forth between our Ethiopian guest and also our guest who is, is speaking about uh, the perspective from Egypt. Asho, what is going on here? How do you get out of this situation? Yeah, this I have been hearing for uh, decades, and I think this will continue to go on. There are two reasons behind it. It's a lack of trust. I think the lack of trust has been because, I think, a lack of communication. Uh, as, uh, it, it is a hydropower dam. Uh, it is not going to take the water out of the system. It will produce a, a huge amount of hydropower, which will be beneficial for a large number of Ethiopians and also the neighboring countries. Uh, it will have certain kind of uh, uh, challenge for the, you know, while the filling the dam to the e Egypt. But Egypt also has been using the water for very unsustainable manner for agricultural purposes for a long period of time. So I think the, what has happened is, is that there are, there are a possibility of adjusting both of their priorities, uh, finding a, a, a solution or finding in a way that both, and also Sudan, they can all benefit mm -hmm. out of it. And I think that's where the real problem is. The problem is the yeah. politicians politicizing the water. And this is because of the politicizing mm -hmm. this water or water power, water energy, this is what you will see how the situation or the kind of public um, uh, perception about the dam in Ethiopia and the dam in Egypt are very, very different. And I think it's a very important for politicians to desecretize water, depoliticize the water, and talk about the water, talk about the development, talk about the people, rather than getting into their nasty dam politics. Yeah. I see Delaware nodding, but, but, but Timothy is not nodding. Let me just bring in Ahmed Solomon. He's a whole I, I agree with you politicizing it. I, just, I disagree with mm -hmm. some of the other points about the limit yeah. of the impact. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. Let me just bring in this. Uh, Ahmed Solomon, he's a, a Horn of Africa Research Fellow at Chatham House. Ahmed. After a decade of stalled talks, reaching a successful deal between the three countries on the dam, as well as on outdated water sharing agreements, isn't going to be easy. Uh, it requires brave leadership, a de-escalation of nationalist rhetoric, as well as compromise by all sides to ensure that the gaps are narrowed between them. This diplomatic success is badly needed for both regional stability and progress. Timothy, the dam has already started to be filled. How does Egypt negotiate when the dam is being filled right now? Well, that's been an enormous problem for Egypt from the outset. It's that it has very little, if any, leverage over Ethiopia directly, which is why it has sought international mediation for quite some time now, because it realizes that it alone uh, can't really pressure Ethiopia. And Ethiopia has more or less uh, proceeded with talks, but been imposing tax on the ground and sort of a fait accompli situation that Egypt mm -hmm. hasn't been able to, uh, to move the needle on. Um, and I think that they realize that, which is why they appeal to the UN Security Council, to the United States, the World Bank, to, to countless other uh, allies in the hope that they can find somebody else who perhaps has a little bit more leverage over Ethiopia. But no, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, they're in a very difficult situation. No doubt. Adela, I see, I see you nodding your head. This is a headline that yeah. Al Jazeera shared quite recently uh, here on my laptop. U.S. suspends aid to Ethiopia over Blue Nile Dam dispute. It feels like you're being pressurized. And how are you, um, as Ethiopians, responding to that pressure? To say we're being pressurized is an understatement, but uh, let's be fair to the process. It's been close to 10 years and we have agreed on many, many issues regarding the filling of the dam. In 2015, we had the Declaration of Principles where these three countries agreed on basic uh, principles of negotiations and the sustainable use of the Nile waters, which is a big step. In that agreement, we also agreed that the construction and negotiations of the dam will go parallel. So it's not, it's actually disingenuous to say, to, to make it look like if you Ethiopia is like uh, holding the holding the discussions while trying to while I, I don't know some kind of stall stalling or uh, as uh, Timothy put it a fair complete project that's not exactly true so there was that. Uh, 
that significant progress. And then we have also agreed on, let's say, the filling, the, um, the rate of filling of the dam. So we generally, there's an agreement on uh, on how many years it should, should take to fill the dam. So there's an agreement on the four to seven years. There's an agreement on many, many other technical issues. There are just three sticking points in the negotiations now. So it's actually, mm -hmm. I don't think it's uh, right to, to to, to paint the negotiations as a complete failure. We have come a long way, not as fast as we should have. The negotiations are a tiresome process and it shouldn't take this long, right. honestly. Let me just, let me, I would let me like bring it to end, but in, mm -hmm. in fairness, let me, let me bring, we have come a, me, a long way. Uh, uh, Asha, let me, let me bring in, uh, you in here. I want to share this with you, Asha, before, before you comment. This is Johannes, uh, and he was talking to us on Twitter. Beyond the polarised narratives, Egypt and Ethiopia must keep negotiating in good faith, followed by cooperation and applying international water law. Where are we now, Asha, uh, after a decade? Are, are, are we close? I, I think it is, uh, uh, there have been uh, lots of round grounds have been covered. Uh, there is a few sticking points, which one of the major one is that if there is a longer period of dry season, how that will be, uh, you know, cooperate the dam that time. And also whether the, uh, um, the agreement which will be signed, whether it will be a legally binding agreement or which will have the, how it will be adjudicated. I think these are the two major points which I can see. Uh, and I think the uh, thing is that there, there is a there is a need. It, these are not extremely uh, difficult points to be really if there is a political willingness to do it. Mm. Uh, it's unfortunately they need to uh, you know uh, somehow calm down and uh, look at this. And I think what has started started this year. The started they started first year. Of course, this first year there was a there was a no de jure agreement, but there was a de facto. The, uh, Ethiopia mm. failed it without an agreement, but it has been failed. And I think there is a still get 10, 10 months of time. They can negotiate. If they really don't have the possibility of negotiating for a long-term basis, they can possibly negotiate for a couple, one, one year me, or two let years. Let me just bring and, uh, start. But, but mm -hmm. let me, I think that there is a one thing which I want to say, the kind of thing Please, is Ashe. that I think the African Union is the best <sighs> possible... Asha, 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 you, you, uh, you, 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 you are thinking exactly what I was thinking and exactly what Caleb was thinking, because I wanted to bring Caleb in here. Caleb is on Twitter, says the African Union is the only legitimate body with the credibility to manage, guide and facilitate negotiation process. After all, the Nile Basin is an African river basin, Asha. Yeah, this is what I was trying to say, because I think for the first time when um, Egypt brought out to bring uh, United States to the negotiating table, Egypt, Ethiopia agreed. But the U.S. or the Trump administration didn't have the patience, didn't have the real finance to really push this agreement, to push, go for a proper agreement, proper negotiator. You know, they wanted to force the agreement, particularly for the election coming or whatever. But I think then we, Egypt went to the Security Council. Security Council must know that they don't really get into this kind of damn negotiation. And I think there are all kinds <laughs> of problems within Security Council to get into this. Mm -hmm. So I think African Union, as you say, I think, because why African Union? I mean, African Union is, 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 a, is a regional organization. It, it, it has a Issues, but I think what it is that all these three member countries, uh, three countries, Iberian mm -hmm. countries, are the members of it. So it will be able to po possibly will have a certain kind of uh, ac acceptability by Asha, all the if countries. I may, if I has, may, yes, if yes, I, if I may, because we could we've been talking about this for decades, so we could talk about this for an hour yeah. for sure. But I want to bring oh, yeah. in William <laughs> Davidson, <laughs> who who actually reminds us what the entire great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam project was all about. William? Uh, the only way for all countries to secure their interests here is through cooperation. Uh, that will allow Sudan and Egypt to ensure that Ethiopia commits to allowing enough water downstream during filling, during times of drought. Um, and ultimately, this will ensure that um, Egypt and Sudan get their minimum water supplies and also that all countries are able to benefit from the Renaissance Dam. Um, whose ambition initially was for it to be a regional project with advantages not just to Ethiopia, but other countries. Mm, been in discussion, debate for a decade. We could po can't possibly address it all in 25 minutes, but McDellerit and Timothy and Asha, you did a fantastic job of boiling it down and, and really connecting it to the people of the Nile Basin as well. Uh, the one thing that struck me, Asha, when you were talking about the dam project, there's a double entendre there that I won't go into deeper. But thank you for your, your perspective. Really appreciate all of you guests. I'm Femi OK, signing off from the Home Edition studio. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.